So I first learned about Emmeline Pankhurst when I was maybe 10 years old in school. It was probably my first introduction to feminism, which I hadn't actually thought about until coming here today. My first introduction to even women standing up for not being able to vote. I would say that Emmeline doesn't really influence my aesthetic or my visuals and my arts or my writing today, but she's the only reason I'm able to vote and be a voter today, which is just amazing. I think that when I first learned about the suffragettes, I remember being 10 years old in a class, not really even understanding my place in the world as a woman because no one really spoke about it. So to read about all of this outrage that was going on with women not even being able to vote, it just seemed like the most insane idea to me, but it was because I'd always seen my mum vote, I'd always seen people in my life vote. So to think about a time where that wasn't even existing, it's just even such a privilege to look at it as something as crazy because it's just so normal now. And it's because of women like her that we can even vote in the first place. Something that gave me the push to talk about the things I talk about today was just having enough with coming up against the same cycles every single day. I think that I was trying to have these conversations with people in my hometown where I grew up. No one was really listening to me. And as soon as I started speaking about this stuff online, I found that there were so many other women who cared about this. So for me, it was like, you almost get pushed to the edge where you just can't take the way that things are anymore. So for me, it was being pushed over the edge with things like sexual harassment and going out and noticing this behavior that didn't sit comfortably with me, but that the culture had learned to accept as the norm. Anytime I experienced that massive surge of rage, my way to channel it has always been with art. I think that you need to know your strength. You don't need to do extreme things. Everyone needs to know their place in the movement, whether that is writing, whether it's speaking, whether it's you know writing petitions, whatever it is that you wanna do, you can contribute to the movement in a way that's best suited to your skills. So I'd say that my old school feminist icon would be Gloria Steinem. And my more modern day one would be Monroe Bergdorf. I'm her friend and I work closely with her, but she is so amazing and the way that she throughout her career has consistently, every single step of the way, elevated people. Like she talks about people in rooms that they're not in and I see her all the time. I'll just be out with her and she's going, do you need this? Do you need that? I know a person to sort you out with this. And she's just got this abundance that women are typically not raised to have. We're taught that opportunities are very scarce for us. So for me to have my first role of leadership coming to London, to have this first role model where I'm seeing a woman opening doors for other people that she is in was just so powerful for me. I think if people want to be an ally to women, it's having conversations. And I know that that sounds so basic and, and straightforward and it doesn't feel like it's gonna make a massive change, but it's just a tiny domino effect. I've influenced a lot of people to think different ways and that was just because I uploaded my thoughts online. I didn't know what that was gonna do. I just wrote it into my laptop, put it on Instagram, put it on social media and it started a domino effect. If I did not have the courage in that moment to speak up about those things, it wouldn't have influenced all these people to then go and talk to their families. And then what they say in that family, sometimes you don't need a platform. Your platform is the family table that's your soapbox. I think that we do still view women through the eyes of the male gaze, particularly because most women have internalized the male gaze themselves. So even if you get a female director, what's her lived experience been? To see how she's going to shape this movie, this project, herself. When a woman looks at herself in the mirror, she's always splitting the image. It's, she's never just looking at herself. There is always a voyeur. It's what am I looking at myself through the eyes of another person? So there's always going to be that voyeuristic aspect to when women look at themselves in the mirror, the way uh, women can never really do anything without wondering how we look while we're doing it. I found myself going on bike rides, wondering if I look pretty in the wind. And all of this, it's like that we're never just doing things, we're splitting half of our brain thinking, what do I look like while I'm doing it? Do you know how much energy that zaps out? And I think that even having a conscious awareness of that is the only way to extrapolate it from our minds. So I think that the male gaze, while it is still prevalent, and also I feel like that term has been stripped from its original meaning, it was talking about cinema when we took talk about the male gaze. I think that the way we've been taught to view our bodies, the male gaze also isn't just isolated about like women, it's filtered through all of these beauty standards that are Eurocentric, that are fat phobic, all of this kind of stuff. We still need to acknowledge the fact that we live in a society where women are treated better if they are prettier. So it's acknowledging the two truths of, yes, women shouldn't have to be desirable objects and constantly shave their bodies and apply makeup and have all of this stuff done to appeal to the male idea of beauty. 
And then we still must acknowledge that we live in a society that will give you more benefits, more privileges when you do reflect the beauty standard. Just because we want it gone doesn't mean that it's gone now. So I think being a feminist today is just holding those two really heavy truths of this is how we'd like it to be, this is how it is. How can we work in a way that's not shaming women for doing what they want with their bodies in a society that's gonna judge you either way? If you don't get all of this stuff done, if you don't roll this makeup, if you don't style yourself, you will be shamed. And if you do, you will be shamed by the feminists. So it's just about finding a way that merges the two. So you can just, you just gotta hold the complexity and think critically about the stuff. I do think that feminism has become more accessible. It's what I wanna do with my work for the rest of my life. It's why I write my books. It's why I have conversations with other people who I think are doing the same thing. I think that when we have these conversations also, we need to remember that not everyone has heard them. Just because you're used to your message about feminism, about the male gaze, about not settling for less than you deserve, in your little corner of college, in your ta dinner table at home, whatever it is, those people aren't used to those conversations that you are. And I think that what social media is doing also, it creates an echo chamber. So you can never say the same thing enough times because there is someone who will be hearing that for the first time. And I think that we can feel sometimes that a message is repetitive or we've heard it enough times. I've even done it in this conversation. I've said, oh, everyone says conversations are the way to move forward. But that doesn't mean that someone doesn't need to hear that. And I think that with social media and the power of social media is that it's just given platforms to like you don't need to to like um compromise yourself to, to be accepted by a platform you can now create your own platform with yourself as the soapbox with yourself as the center of a community of people and that's not to say it's easy it takes a lot of courage to show up online it takes a lot of courage to speak your mind but even just like following those pages of other people who are doing amazing stuff i think is it's amazing and we've been able to kind of democratize information now, which is just amazing. And that wasn't able to happen years and years and years and years and years ago. So yeah, I think social media has made feminism more accessible. It also has, um, like, like with anything, it could also be tainted, taken away from its original message, but I don't think that that's a new problem. I think that is just an existing problem put on steroids by the virality of social media.